I'd like to welcome everyone back from our 15 minute break. Uh, and it's really my pleasure now to introduce our next speaker, Professor Kate Pickett. Uh, she is professor of epidemiology. She is also deputy director of the Center for Future Health and associate director for the Leverhulme Center for Anthropocene Biodiversity. These are all at the University of York. She is co-author with Richard Wilkinson of a book entitled The Spirit Level, published in 2009, and another book, The Inter Level, uh, the, I'm sorry, The Inner Level, published in 2018. Professor Pickett is a trustee of the Wellbeing Economy Alliance and patron of the Equality Trust, and recently chaired the Greater Manchester Independent Inequalities Commission. Uh, and if you would like to follow her, she has a, a Twitter account at P-R-O-F-K-E-P-I-C-E-T-T. -E -E you can see it on our website under her bio. Uh, it's a pleasure to have her with us today to continue this important discussion about the relationship between inequalities and violence. The title of her talk is How More Equal Societies Reduce Stress, Restore Sanity, and Improve Everyone's Well-Being. Professor Pickett, it is all yours. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Rhoda. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for that introduction. And um, good morning, everybody. It's afternoon here in England, it's tea time, but um, I know it's morning for you. I'm going to share my screen. So let's see if we can, okay. That looks like it's working to me. So what I'd like to talk to you about this morning is the role of inequality in producing differences in societal levels of conflict, violence, of, of stressful interactions, of lack of solidarity, and also how important that is in our contemporary context of COVID, of climate change, and of high levels of, of global conflict. But I thought I'd start by thinking about our um, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble moving my, my slides along. There we go. I thought I'd start by thinking about our evolutionary history, actually, and us as social animals closely related to our primate ancestors and cousins. We, like them, are highly attuned social animals. We care about our relationships with other members of our species very much and our well-being is determined by our relationships with one another. And like our primate relations, we can be quite aggressive towards one another in our interpersonal relationships, or we can be each other's best source of comfort, security, support, emotional well-being. And just like our primate cousins, we can do both of those things switching from one to another on a daily basis. We can be conflict-ridden, we can be collegial, we can be fighting, we can be friendly. And we can switch between those strategies in a heartbeat if we need to. But also, our societies can exhibit more or less of those two different patterns of interacting. So humans have, throughout our prehistory and our history, lived in societies that were very egalitarian, based on reciprocity, sharing and caring, but we've also lived in extremely hierarchical societies where everybody knows their place, where rank is really important and where the social structure determines your access to happiness, health, well-being, material resources and more. And we often think about societies as shaped like a pyramid. We, we often talk about 
certainly in, in the UK, we talk about the social class pyramid. We think about the people at the top as those having more income and more wealth, higher levels of education, higher levels of social class, and those at the bottom of the pyramid having less material resources, lower incomes, less ass assets, less wealth, lower levels of education, lower levels of social class. And we tend to think about the, um, society as a pyramid because in most societies there are fewer people at the top than there are at the bottom. Now, human societies don't have to be shaped like a pyramid. They could be shaped more like um, an onion with most people in the middle and fewer people at the top and, and fewer people again at the bottom. But in general, our contemporary human societies do tend to have this sort of pyramid structure. But they're not all as steep a pyramid as each other. So we have societies that are more egalitarian where the social pyramid is flatter. And we have societies where the social pyramid is steeper. If you want to think about society as a ladder instead of as a pyramid, you can think about some societies having a ladder that is steeper and where the rungs are further apart and some societies where the ladder is flatter and it's easier to move from one rung to another. So we have societies that are more egalitarian and less egalitarian, more hierarchical and less hierarchical. And if we're looking at um, the rich developed countries, this slide shows OECD countries, well, it's a selection of OECD countries, organized by um, financial inequality, we can see variation among those countries. So among OECD countries, here we've got um, the share of wealth held by the richest 10% of households, and it's 79% in the United States. So the top 10th of the population have got almost 80% of the wealth. And that's quite different in Japan, where the top 10th only have less than half of, of the wealth within the country. And so there's variation in modern market democracies in the amount of financial inequality that is there. And wealth inequality tends to track income inequality. So if we ranked countries by income inequality, they wouldn't look very different, um, certainly in their position or if we looked at educational inequality, social class inequality. So some countries are more equal than others at the moment. But there's also variation across time. So just because a country is currently very unequal doesn't mean it always has been. And if we look at countries over the past 100 years, over the past century, countries have changed their levels of inequality quite dramatically over that time. So if we look at the United States, which is the um, black line ending up highest on the right hand side of the graph in 2010, currently the most unequal of that small set of countries. But if we look back in the middle of last century, it was a much more equal society. So on this chart, we're looking at um, the top 1% share of all income. Um, how much of all income does the top 1% have? It's very high right now in the United States, but it was much, much lower in the middle of the century. And all of these countries have followed a similar pattern over the past 100 years. They were very unequal in the 1920s, the 1930s. Then they became much more equal post Second World War and stayed quite egalitarian through to the late 1970s, early 1980s, and then we saw a modern rise in income and wealth inequality, which continues to this day. So just because your country is unequal at the moment doesn't mean it always has been, doesn't mean it's a fixed characteristic of your society. Countries can change, and, and I think that's a hopeful thing to remember um, as we go through this talk. So do those different levels of inequality matter? 
Um, in this cartoon, you've got a little lad sitting on, on, on his father's lap and his father saying, well, it goes in cycles, Junior. Sometimes the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Sometimes the rich get richer and the poor stay the same. Saying that inequality is inevitable. Well, we've just seen that it's not really inevitable in that different countries can exhibit different levels of inequality. And it's not inevitable given that countries can change their level of inequality over time. But does it matter? There are people who think that we can't have economic growth without inequality. And so we need to tolerate a certain amount of inequality because otherwise we won't have economic growth. There are others who think that inequality promotes aspirations and so it drives social mobility and creativity. And if we don't have inequality, then people don't have an incentive to try and get ahead, to be innovative, to be creative, to work hard. Others think inequality itself doesn't matter, it doesn't harm us, it's only poverty that matters. It matters if you don't have enough, but if you can get your society above a certain threshold and not too many poor people within it, then inequality doesn't really matter. And some people think it's inevitable, we have horrible human natures, we don't really need to think about tackling inequality because it will be completely impossible to do anything about it. So we've already sort of seen that um, our human nature isn't, it isn't really inevitably one way or another. We are plastic, adaptive, flexible social animals. And so the way we organize our societies is up to us and is not dependent on a fixed human nature. Um, let's take those other two first. Can we have economic growth without inequality and, and does it actually mean that we get more social mobility. In fact, there's no correlation at all between income redistribution and growth. Um, these are data from the World Bank, and there are lots of studies now that show you don't have to have inequality to have economic growth. Whether you want economic growth is a different argument in, in our era of, of climate emergency but you certainly don't have to have income inequality to create economic growth. And in fact, the International Monetary Fund say that high levels of inequality hamper economic growth and they hamper poverty reduction. So, that, so there's no reason to tolerate high levels of inequality for an economic growth reason. And there are lots of studies now, this one from PORAC, um, using World Bank data, showing that in fact there is less social mobility in countries with bigger income differences. So less social mobility in more unequal societies and more chance of transcending your class of origin um, in more equal societies. And incidentally, Lots of new studies showing that you get more innovation in more egalitarian societies as well. If we look at that by measuring patents per capita as a measure of innovation. So as inequality is not harming social mobility, quite the opposite. Inequality is not harming economic growth, quite the opposite. We don't have a fixed human nature that requires a particular level of inequality. So is it harmful? That's the sort of remaining question. And in fact, it's very broadly harmful. Um, if we have high levels of income inequality in a society, we get increased levels of a whole host of health and social problems. It's so widespread that I could probably spend two hours showing you chart after chart after chart of associations between income inequality and different kinds of problems in lots of different settings. But we'll just look at a few. Um, this is our index of health and social problems that we created, gosh, over 10 years ago now. Um, it's an index of health problems, including life expectancy, infant mortality, mental health and obesity. But it also includes 
social aspects of a society like levels of trust, levels of um, violence, levels of imprisonment, and levels of teenage birth rates and levels of education and levels of social mobility. So lots of different things in, in a single index. And here, each country um, plotted on that index in relation to the level of income inequality within the country. And we're looking here at rich developed market democracies. So in this chart, the USA is the most unequal of that set of countries and has the highest level of health and social problems. Portugal and the UK also not doing well. Japan and the Scandinavian countries doing much better on this measure. And if you know a country's level of income inequality, you've got a pretty good prediction of its performance on this index of health and social problems. Now, some people might look at that chart and think, well, that's just a problem of, of particular kinds of countries. There's something a little odd about those Scandinavian countries. The English speaking countries don't do so well, but you could take away Japan and the Scandinavian countries. You could take away the English speaking countries. You've still got a statistically significant association between income inequality and levels of health and social problems. And there's some interesting indicators here that this isn't due to cultural differences between different kinds of societies. So if you compare the position of Spain um, and Portugal, who are very similar culturally and lots of historical similarities as well, but very different in their levels of income inequality and therefore very different in how they perform on the index of health and social problems. And then down here at the um, equal end on the left, Japan and Sweden, very equal in terms of income, very low in terms of health and social problems, very, very different in many other aspects, very culturally dissimilar. But further proof that it's income inequality that's the issue here and not, not some other factor, um, comes if we look at the same relationships among the different US states. So here we don't really need to worry about um, particular cultural differences between countries. We've got better performance on an index of the same health and social problems in more equal states than in more unequal states. Not as tight a correlation, but still a significant one. So let's just look at one or two of the components of that index that are relevant to, to the discussion today about societal violence um, and conflict. And here's trust. So these data are for different countries. They come from the World Values Survey and it's a response among random samples of the population to a question that asks if most if, if other people can be trusted. So it's a measure of generalized trust, not do you trust people you know, but, but can people in general be trusted? And in the more equal societies, about two thirds of the population think that you can trust others. And it's down to less than a fifth in the more unequal of those societies. And very similar pattern if we look at the US states. Um, in the more equal ones, again, about two thirds of the population think that other people can be trusted. These are data from the General Social Survey, and it's down to a third or less in the more unequal of those states. And we think that generalized trust, which is part of what people think of as social capital, is a really important indicator of what relationships are like between people in a society. So remember, we've got that human capacity to be each other's best source of support, friendship and collegiality, or we can be competitive, aggressive out for ourselves. And this measure of trust is a really good indicator, I suppose, of the, of the social temperature of a society, of what it feels like to live in different places. You know, if you are a woman walking home alone, 
in a state or a society with high levels of trust? How does that feel compared to walking home alone in the dark in a society where few people trust one another? Um, these measures are reflecting, I think, that, that lived experience of relationships among people, what it's like on the school playground, you know, levels of bullying, what it's like for young men to walk past other groups of young men on the street, what, what it's like in public spaces, in parks, on public transport, um, in the workplace, how people interact with one another. And when levels of trust decline in a society, that seems to have spilling over consequences for a whole range of other things. Civic participation declines in more unequal places. People are less likely to engage in solidarity with their neighbors in, in civic activities. They're less likely to vote. They're less likely to be engaged in, in politics, in, in civil society in general. And so there's a decline of that sense that we're all in it together and that we're all helping each other out, a decline in solidarity. And in fact, there are empirical studies of income inequality in relation to people's willingness to help their neighbors. But we can also see those trends reflected in a more direct measure of societal violence. And here are homicide rates for US states and Canadian provinces from Martin Daly and colleagues in Canada. The US states are the red dots, the Canadian provinces are the blue triangles. And we can see that in the more equal of the Canadian provinces, there are about 15 murders per million people. In the more unequal US states, that rate is 10 times higher. We're seeing about 150 homicides per million people. And again, a very close correlation with the level of inequality in those states and in those provinces. We see higher levels of imprisonment in more unequal societies. And interestingly, this isn't just because crime rates are higher in more unequal places. It's because the judicial system is harsher. And so that sense of trust, that sense of all being in it together, when that gets eroded, people are not just sort of harsh to one another in an interpersonal way, but the judicial system becomes harsher as well, less tolerant of variation, less tolerant of de deviance, more willing to sort of lock people up and, and throw away the key. So we see 16 fold differences in the level of imprisonment in the most unequal country here, the USA and the more equal countries. So again, a very strong correlation between imprisonment and inequality. And so societies with wider income differences need what's called guard labor more. So they need more protective service and employees, they need more police, they need more military personnel, they need more people protecting us from one another, protecting property and people from what other people might do to them. So protect them from robbery, to protect them from violence. So higher levels of guard labor in more unequal societies. And again, this being a real reflection of the state of social relationships within people and the extent to which those are improved with lower inequality and deteriorate with greater inequality. Now, the data we've been looking at have been from the rich developed market democracies, from OECD countries in effect. Um, and although we can see variation in inequality between them, there are of course places in the world that are much more unequal than any of these countries. They tend not to have such great data to be able to, to do some comparisons, 
Sometimes you can, but, but it's harder. But if you actually go to those societies, you can feel, you can feel and live that um, level of deterioration in social relationships. You can see it writ large on the streets of those societies and you, you can feel it in your interactions with people. Um, here's a photo of just a residential street in Cuernavaca in Mexico. Um, it's privileged to, to visit Mexico to discuss research on, on inequality and was struck by how residences um, are protected from one another. Usually houses have high gates like here you know, that, that are difficult to, would be difficult to, to scale, um, razor wire coiled along the streets and people really living in fear of their neighbours, people living in fear of other people. Um, and this picture from South Africa, and here, I'm sorry, it's a little blurred, but in this residence in South Africa, you've not only got those high gates, those guys, that locked access to a residential property, that's not razor wire above it, that's an electric wire. Um, there is an armed response, you know, so if you do try to get in, somebody might turn up and shoot you. Um, and there are large dogs lingering in, in the background as well. And in those very unequal societies, levels of violence are extremely high. The murder rate is higher. The level of um, interpersonal violence is very high. And the level of violence against women tends to be high as well. So it went from sort of thinking about us as individual social animals and then looking at societal levels of, of violence in relation to inequality. But really what we need to be thinking about is the intersection of those things. So how the level of inequality makes an individual feel and how that then triggers different individual responses towards violence or not, so that that actually changes the prevalence, the level of violence in a society. And I think this chart is, is, is very helpful in us thinking about that, actually. So this chart comes from colleagues in Ireland, Late and Whelan, and they looked at levels of anxiety about status in different societies in Europe. These are European countries, um, so it's data from 30 different countries. And they looked at levels of status anxiety in the most equal of those countries, the least equal of those countries and countries that were sort of in the middle. So what we're looking at here are levels of status anxiety in different countries. So the prevalence of status anxiety on a, on a score, it's a measure. Um, higher is bad. So more status anxiety, the higher up you are on the, on the y-axis. And we're looking at the levels of status anxiety for people in the poorest tenth of the population, the second poorest tenth, the third poorest tenth, and so on up to the, the richest tenth. So everybody's being organized by their own personal incomes, but we're looking at the average levels of status anxiety across the income distribution in countries with low levels of inequality, countries with high levels of inequality and countries in between. So not surprisingly, people are more worried about their status if they're poor. So in all kinds of countries, we see a trend towards more anxieties about status further down the income distribution and less anxieties about status at the top of society. But the gap between the high inequality countries and the low inequality countries is present right across the income distribution. So even if you're poor, very poor, in the poorest tenth of the population, you're less likely to be anxious about your status in a low inequality country compared to a high inequality country. And that's true at the top of society as well. And it is when our status is threatened by other people and when we feel disrespected, put down, um, looked down upon, that is the most common trigger 
to violence. And we know that from studies from prison psychiatrists, we know that um, from studies of, of people who've been incarcerated, people who report on why, why they were violent, that it's when they feel disrespected, when they feel their status is threatened, when they feel they have no status in society, that, that we start to see triggers to violence. And we can see that finally in relation to intimate partner violence and domestic violence and inequality, which we couldn't do for a long time because it was very hard to get comparable data on domestic violence because there's much more likelihood of it being reported in some places than in others. And, and so you were picking up on win, women's willingness to disclose rather than true prevalence rates. But um, we finally got some data from different countries in Latin America that are culturally fairly similar and the data had all been collected in the, in the same method. And you can see a relationship there, a statistically significant tendency for more intimate partner violence among the more unequal of Latin American countries. So as countries become more unequal, people worried more about their status are more likely to react with violence to any threats to that status. And we see that in, in multiple ways, in multiple ways when we measure it, violence against women, levels of homicides. Um, we see it in levels of bullying among school children. We see it in levels of maltreatment of children. So lots of different ways that we can look at violence, the breakdown of social relationships, and link that to inequality and understand really where, where it's coming from. Now, what has that meant really that that effect of inequality on societal levels of trust and solidarity and, and participation and collegiality, what, what has that meant in the time of COVID? What's the link between income inequality um, and how countries have responded to COVID. I think to some people that seems like a bit of, bit of a reach, you know, why, why should levels of income inequality, wealth inequality affect how countries have responded to COVID, but in fact it has. And I think a lot of it is to do with this breakdown of trust. You know, you can get a society to comply with prevention measures, restrictions, um, all the things you might need to do to tackle a pandemic if you've got high levels of trust um, within a society and levels of trust between the public and government. You can tackle the problem of a pandemic more easily if you don't start out that pandemic with high levels of health inequalities, which are caused by income inequalities. And if you don't have problems of a low paid workforce who cannot afford to um, work from home or cannot afford to shield themselves from exposure to COVID. And if you've got a sense that you're all in it together, then the kind of community level and societal level solidarity that you need to tackle a global pandemic is more likely to be there in a more equal country. And so we're starting to get data through um, that shows links between inequality, socioeconomic inequality, and COVID deaths. There's two charts on the left here. Um, these are American data from, from different states. The top one looking at COVID cases and the bottom looking at COVID deaths in relation to inequality. And then three charts on the right are looking at different countries. They're looking at top one total deaths, um, the middle one, uh, sorry, in relation to one measure of inequality, the middle one total deaths in relation to another measure of inequality, and the bottom one excess deaths in relation to inequality. That's probably the most reliable data we have here. And interestingly, on these three charts on the right, those with women leaders are shaded um, in lighter colors 
and countries with female leaders have had a better response to COVID, to the pandemic, and have suffered fewer excess deaths. And that's probably not because those women leaders are, are doing something different that is to do with their, their gender necessarily, but that having women leaders in the society is a reflection of more egalitarian social values in general, and therefore lower levels of inequality. So before I finish in time for questions, I wanted just to turn to um, the other big contemporary issue facing our societies, and that is the climate emergency, and asking the question of what, what else happens to societies when they become more unequal and therefore more materialistic and more individualistic? In what sense is that a barrier to us achieving the kinds of social change we need to, to address the climate emergency and deal? with climate change. And because inequality reduces levels of trust, um, levels of empathy and solidarity, and that sense that we're all in it together, we're not just less good to one another, to people in more unequal societies, we're less good at acting for the good of the planet as well. So we see more recycling in more equal societies, um, more equal countries ranking better on recycling. We see that business leaders are more likely to think that their governments should comply with international environmental agreements in more equal societies. We see that carbon emissions per hundred dollars of income per capita are higher in more unequal societies. And we even are starting to see studies linking income inequality to levels of biodiversity in different places. And again, not, lots of mechanisms for this, but many of them to do with governance, corruption, trust, land tenure, um, plausible pathways from income inequality to biodiversity protection or destruction. So if we want to create a safe and just space for humanity, and this is Kate Rayworth's um, donut economics, the sustainable and desirable donut, where we have a safe and just space for humanity, that means we're living within our environmental boundaries, our planetary boundaries, but that we have strong social foundations social equity, gender equity, health, etc. that we have that space and just space for humanity is to a great extent dependent on us tackling inequality. Inequality is a barrier to us being in that safe and just space for humanity. And helpfully, this is reflected within the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, goal number 10, is to reduce socioeconomic inequalities and other inequalities. I think one of the limitations of the UN SDGs, and you know, we, we must be really grateful that we have international consensus on a set of goals for sustainable development in the world. But the limitation of them is that there is just sort of a dash forward of things that we think are important. And looking at them like this, we don't see the interconnections between them. You know, we don't really see that in order to reduce poverty, we have to tackle inequalities. In order to create well-being, we must reduce inequality. If we want decent work for everybody and economic growth, we need to tackle inequalities. If we want to take action on climate, create sustainable cities, we have to tackle inequality. And so inequality really is at the heart of achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals. It's really at the heart of us tackling the pandemic. It's really at the heart of us understanding how to reduce conflict within and between societies. And so it's really central to all of the good we would wish to do for people and the planet. So I'm going to stop there and look forward to having some discussion with you and, and 
hearing your questions. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Pickett. Very fascinating uh, charts and, of course, information and uh, really brings to light this whole relationship between inequalities and human well-being. Um, we have uh, one question. I, I invite the audience to please use the Q&A function to uh, uh, ask your questions. This is the time to do so. So from Jonathan Gamble, uh, he, he says, statistics on the effects of public discourse slash political rhetoric on social violence. In other words, are there statistics? I'm assuming that's what he's asking on yeah. this. That's a really good question, and I'm not the right person to answer it. Um, there are certainly studies of right-wing politics, populism, and inequality. So we certainly see greater sort of political divisiveness and and. and tendency for, for populist voting, voting for right-wing populists actually, in relation to inequality, but I don't know about rhetoric, but I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm an epidemiologist and not a political scientist, and I wonder if there are data out there, so if anybody in the audience knows an answer to that, I'd be really interested. I would have thought that relationship would be there, but possibly, having good quality data to be able to show that might be challenging because I'm not sure what the measure would be for diversive political rhetoric or disruptive political rhetoric. Um, so if anybody else would like to chip in on that, I'd be really interested. All right, uh, Kate, do you want to ask, read the next one? Sure, uh, so the next question is from Selby Zambihi. Uh, to what extent can some of these differences in well-being be attributed to prevalence and degree of poverty in higher inequality countries? Can an argument be made that the wealthy also suffer some of the other impacts of inequality in the way that you illustrated with status anxiety? Yes, is the short answer. So clearly, um, poverty is strongly related to health. And so some of the health inequalities that we see between different societies and within societies is due to poverty. But almost every single health outcome that we might look at has what we call a social gradient. So it's not just that it suddenly becomes more common amongst the poor. There is almost always a very, very finely tuned social gradient from the bottom of society to the top. So if, for instance, we looked at a measure of health like life expectancy, it will be lowest among the poorest, but it will be lower among the people in the sort of 80th to 90th percentile at the top than it is at the very top. And those people are clearly not poor but their life expectancy is lower than those at the very top. And that pattern of finely tuned social gradients is almost ubiquitous. You find it with almost every health outcome you look at. I can think of a couple of exceptions, a couple of cancers that don't exhibit that pattern. And you, you can sort of see it everywhere. And you see it by education, by income, by wealth, by social class. And so although poverty really, really does matter, and we must tackle poverty, inequality matters as well. And so you tend to get a steeper social gradient in health in more unequal societies. Um, the, so the average health is worse, but the gap between the top and the bottom is worse as well. At the moment in our country, in the UK, we've got a government that claims its main ambition is to level up. So it talks about leveling up all the time. It's to level up society. It wants to reduce inequalities between the north and the south of England. It, want, it wants to level up. Now, to level up, you, you've got to raise 
the whole platform. You can't just tackle poverty at the bottom. You've got to sort of think about the inequalities all the way up from top to bottom in society. So health looks like that. Lots of other social outcomes have those gradients as well. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty common pattern and we must deal with both. We must level up from the top, from the bottom, but we need to level from the top down too. Next question. Next question is from Lester Andrist. What's your view on who addresses this problem? Is inequality a problem that must be addressed by governments rather than wealthy philanthropists? Um, I think it's such an important problem. It needs to be tackled by everybody at every level. And, and that's not just sort of a, a facetious easy answer. We need different solutions at, at different scales. So a lot of the inequality in the world, we need international action on it. Um, we need international action on tax havens and the ability of, of, of the super wealthy to be corrupt and to not pay their taxes and to squirrel away their wealth. That needs international agreement. And we need international goal setting around poverty like we have for the um, UN Sustainable Development Goals. So there's certain things that really need to happen by countries cooperating with one another. Then there's a lot that must be done at national level. So if you think about tackling inequalities of income and wealth, you can really do it in two ways. You can either allow income inequalities to be there and then redistribute money through taxes and benefits, do a lot of redistribution. Or you can do what in my country is called pre-distribution, which is to try and narrow the income differences to start with before tax. But any solution that's going to require fiscal um, changes, tax changes, then you're going to need your national government engaged in doing that. Um, taxing business, taxing the wealthy, giving tax breaks to the poor, doing that kind of redistribution, having a strong social security net so that those who cannot work for whatever reason um, are also supported. That tends to be you know, something that you need at a national level. But the trouble with those sorts of solutions is that as soon as you get a change of government, you get a change of tax regime. Um, and I'm sure we've all seen that it throughout our lifetimes. You know, new government comes in, new tax regime, you thought you were doing all right, and all of a sudden it's been reversed. And so some of the solutions that are about reducing income differences before tax feel more, more stable, really. If, if you're trying to create cultures in the workplace, in institutions that reduce income differences at source, those feel more stable, more part of changing the culture. So if we decide that <clears throat> within companies, we shouldn't have bosses who earn huge, huge, huge amounts and then workers who cannot really afford a decent standard of living. And we decide we're not going to sort of tolerate that within our institution and we'll lower those things. That's changing the culture of work really. And it's changing the culture of how salaries are set. And that's not subject to the vagaries of a change in national government. So everything that we can do around improving democracy within places where wages are set, so democracy at work, democracy within institutions, employee representation on company boards, um, trade unions and um, mutuals, cooperatives, different ways of doing business, all of that tends to reduce income differences to start with. Um, and then that's feels more stable and less subject to, to political whim and changes. But then, of course, we all have local government um, that has different power and diff different, different remit to do, to do different things. So local government can be a good example locally of paying living wage and reducing differences, requiring that companies with whom they interact do the same thing. So you can get a lot of change at local government level you can get change within institutions but i actually think as well on an interpersonal level 
we all really need to think about what does what does egalitarianism mean? What does equality mean? You know, we're all quite happy to, I think, to think about equality before the law. But what, what does equality as a human being mean? How do we make sure that we interact with one another with respect, that we value each other, and that we ourselves are not part of those structures and hierarchies that keep some people down and prevent them flourishing and treat them with less respect than they deserve. So I think it goes all the way from the individual, within families, within communities, institutions, up through all the different levels of government to the international kind of cooperation. And we need action at all of those levels to tackle this really entrenched and difficult problem. Thank you. So the next question uh, is from Wanjiku Kagira. Could you give examples of best practices where income inequality has been tackled effectively and how that could be replicated in other places? Oh, that's so hard because look, most places are getting worse, not better. Um, if, if we look historically, and you know, I showed you that chart really early on where the United States became a lot more equal in the middle of the last century, lots of other countries did too. Um, we do, so we do have historical examples of when governments decided that they were going to focus on egalitarian policies, that they were going to tax wealth and income progressively, that they were going to give workers rights, give women rights, civil rights movements part of that too. So, so we have examples where countries have managed to reduce their income inequality substantially in the past. We don't have that many countries going in the right direction currently, and it can be really unstable. So Brazil for quite some time was becoming a lot more equal, had policies around supporting families that were really helping to reduce inequalities. But that's been completely reversed under its current political leadership, and Brazil is a country that's becoming a lot more unequal again. At the same time that the United States was becoming more unequal, Japan was becoming more equal. And a lot of that was because the United States imposed various things on Japan after the Second World War, which helped it to become a more egalitarian place, even though at the same time it wasn't doing it, doing it for itself. Often countries and societies have become more equal in the face of external threat. So countries in the face of external threat have realized that to get their populations on board, that they need to create a more egalitarian society and a sense of us all being in it together. So during the world wars, we saw countries become deliberately more equal. Um, and I wonder if actually, if we get serious about tackling climate change, our governments will realize that to do that, they have to have us on board. They have to create more equal societies where we do have a sense of being in it together for us to accept the societal changes that we'll need to make to tackle climate change. There are loads of good case studies from smaller places or countries that are doing one thing right, um, there's nowhere that's doing everything in a really positive way all the time, but there are some governments now that have joined something called the we Wellbeing Government Alliance. Scotland, Wales, Iceland, New Zealand, Finland, who are all committed to pursuing well-being rather than economic growth. Um, and those are countries where some good things are really happening particularly, I think, in relation to children and to the environment. So there are sort of examples of good practice, um, but we need to sort of create societies that borrow good things, good examples from lots of different sort of sectors and at lots of different scales. And then we might create some, some utopian places that are getting it all right. Thank you. Um, I think, Kate, you have a question? I did, yes. So I was wondering, and this follows on, I think, quite well from the last one, is how do we, um, to get to the level of kind of solidarity, how do we convince individuals that it's not a zero-sum game, 
when it comes to equality. So it's not if if everybody is equal, then I'm losing out, which seems to be the approach that that a lot of people take. How do we change the mindset um, in in that respect? That's it's a really good question. I think what's really encouraging is that whatever country you're living in and whoever you're talking to, if you ask people, what do you value most in life? They all say the same thing. Whether they're rich or poor, um, male or female, politically on the right, politically on the left, whatever. People value their relationships with their family and friends more than anything. They like their health too. But really what makes them happy is their connections with, with one another. And I think if you can show that that gets undermined in individualistic, striving, competitive societies, then that can be helpful, I think. But in a way, we don't need to convince everybody. We just need to convince the policymakers. Because if we change society, then people will feel different and they will feel better and they will feel those benefits. They will live longer they will be happier, they will be more connected to one another. And so in a way, that's, that's the best way to convince people. I think uh, we don't have any more questions, but if I can follow up on what you just said, so how do we, you know, I'm thinking as you're speaking, you know, there are smart people in government, in NGOs, in, in policy makers. I mean, you know, people are aware uh, and, and as you've shown to, uh, us, th this, um, the sustainability of what you are speaking about today is just not good. You know, it is, it's not a sustainable model. Uh, do you, I, I'm just wondering, is it going to take a huge crisis to wake us up or what, what in your opinion needs to happen? We had a really big crisis, didn't we? We had a huge financial crisis. And I think a lot of us at that point thought, oh, everything will change. You know, that was, that was proof that, that the neoliberal model was, was wrong. It wasn't going to give us trickle down benefits. It wasn't going to improve life for the vast majority of people. You know, we need to fix it. It's caused damage. We need to do things differently. And then we didn't do it. Um, and then with COVID, I'm hearing a lot of those same conversations. This is the moment at which things must change. You know, we need to build back better, bounce back better. Um, we need to take this crisis and learn its lessons. I'm really hoping that, that we will. And of course, with the COP coming up in November in Glasgow, you know, yet again, another moment where be, the world will be reflecting on what needs to change. Yeah, I hope we can start draw drawing the dots. But 10 years ago, nobody was talking about inequality. People did not understand the damage that it did. They understood about poverty, but they didn't understand about inequality. They do now. There's a lot of rhetoric about needing to tackle it. That's the next step. So we've had sort of step one and two, knowledge, talk. Maybe action will be the next thing. Thank you very much. Um, I think, Kate, there is a last question. Yes, so um, the final question is, how could we use the three protagonists of change, individual institutions and community to fight inequality? Well, as I mentioned before, we, we need to use them all. And I suppose, what we really need to think is about how if you use those three, they can effectively amplify one another. Um, and so I think we need to be thinking about the interconnections between them, but also the interconnections between different kinds of inequalities. Um, so if you're tackling gender inequality or race inequalities within an institution, think about tackling your socioeconomic inequalities as well as a way to achieving those other goals. Um, and if you're an institution, how can you actually act to reduce inequalities within your community? And how communities can shape 
the institutions that are within them by demanding change. So I think if we can be encouraging connections across those different levels, that will amplify the impact of everything that we do just within them. I think our time is up, Professor Pickett. I'd like to thank you for a very important presentation today. Uh, it, you've really given us much to think about and some very good data that really give us a better understanding of what is happening around this world. We appreciate your taking the time to be with us today and uh, we wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me and thank you all for listening. A pleasure. And for, the, for our viewers, we are now going to take a break for an hour and, um, an hour and 15 minutes and we will return at, uh, I'm talking about Eastern Daylight Time. We will return uh, at uh, 1 p.m. when we will hear our final speaker, Professor Jeff Ward, who is going to talk about uh, haunting legacies of racial violence, clarifying and addressing the presence of the past. I think this is, something that is extremely important uh, to hear. And I hope that you will join us in about an hour and 15 minutes. We'll see you then. Thank you.